Okay, um, thanks. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here, and I've really um, enjoyed the talks that I've heard, and I'm uh, a little guilty that I'm going to recycle some concepts, because uh, I promise you I wasn't cheating and recycling and, and redoing my talk as we go, but some of the things we've talked about in the afternoon session here have, have come up, uh, but I hope to um, add some new uh, insights to those. So uh, what I'm going to talk about here is, uh, is very much at the food water nexus. It's looking at food security trends and the survivability of people, um, smallholder agriculturalists in Africa primarily. Um, but I'm going to make some connections to some of the other dialogues that we've had here um, the last couple of days. So of course we know that the, the proportion of people um, in uh, Africa's under, uh, undernourished populations is an immense problem. There's a nice story here if you look at the percentage of people who are undernourished. Uh, a nice downward trend here, but uh, alarmingly, if you look at the absolute number of people who are undernourished, it's a very alarming figure. So um, we know that in Africa, uh, there's a large proportion of the uh, land mass that is uh, semi-arid. This is an area where there's particularly acute problems in terms of food shortages and uh, trying to adapt to climate change. So Kenya is one of the places where this is uh, certainly happening. Um, Kenya has different stories in terms of climate histories, depending on who you talk to. This is one diagram that shows a, a precipitous decline in annual precipitation over time. But what's actually a more disturbing and more difficult signal for the farmers is that the periodicity or the seasonal distribution of rainfall is actually changing. So there's an onset of mid-season mid droughts, which creates a huge uncertainty for farmers of what crops to plant, when to plant, where to plant. Now, the, the solution to this, in part, that we know um, has been tried in many places is irrigation. And irrigation can distribute water in space and in time. And in Kenya, there are what are called water towers, that is, areas of higher elevation that lead to a higher level of precipitation in upland areas that then can go into these semi-arid zones and allow agriculture to persist where rain-fed only agriculture really isn't possible. But what happens in these places is that there's this, um, at least a instance of double exposure. That is, there's increasing population. At the same time, there's climate change changing the signal, climate signals and uh, uh, amount of water and in this area, actually, uh, in Kenya particularly, there's what I can call a triple exposure. There is a national level policy of trying to get uh, uh, smallholders and uh, livestock grazers to transition from livestock grazing to agriculture as a pathway out of poverty. And this is creating an a, a increase, a, a, another level of increased uh, population demand on water resources. So what we're looking at then is um, if we have limited water resources, lots of people who want to use it, what's the solution? Well, um, certainly governance and water governance is a, a theme that we've heard a lot about. And I'm going to use the term institutions here in a slightly different way that Sinha was using. And so I'm, I've got a, a definition here. But by institutions, I mean the, the formal rules and laws and the social norms that structure choices. So this can be um, who is allowed to use uh, stream water for irrigation. Uh, what are the penalties for stealing water? Um, who performs monitoring and enforcement? And these may be codified, they may be written down, or they may be informal arrangements between you and I. So I certainly don't mean just because I come from a place where governance is a, a strong focus of the research, I certainly don't mean to say that individual level behaviors are not also important. Of, car of course they are. But the question is, what kinds of institutional arrangements might enable more resilient adaptation to climate change or um, decreasing the level of vulnerability over time and what kinds of solutions work in different places. So um, Kenya is, is unique. Um, it uh, has a, a, a striking level of governance diversity and it provides a very nice laboratory or experiment to see what kinds of solutions are working. And I, I'm doing work in Kenya and Zambia and I can say at least comparing those two places that Kenya has a level of governance and a sophistication of governance perhaps that's uh, simply amazing. When I go there and I, I work in the local communities, I'll hear a, a farmer talk to me, literally will talk to me about building adaptive capacity and about engaging uh, diverse gender representation on communities. So there are these nonprofits that have basically been in these places and are driving a level of 
uh, thinking about management of resources that is uh, truly striking. Um, but then is this question, what works in different places and what doesn't work? So we're looking particularly here in this area around Mount Kenya. It's uh, a couple hours away from uh, Nairobi, the capital city. And this is one of those water towers I was describing to you. And there's a, do I have a pointer on here? I don't know if one of these is a laser or not. Uh, okay, it's a mystery. Um, but the, each of those blue lines there is effectively a tributary a river that's coming down off of the slopes of Mount Kenya. And in the upland areas, there's forest, it's actually protected, and, and so there's some level of governance that's closing that off to agricultural development. Um, but then as you go downstream, you get intensive agriculture, um, smallholder agriculture, and as you go farther down by these um, two communities that I've highlighted there, these are Maasai farmers who are um, only a couple years experimenting and transitioning from a livestock-based livelihood to an agricultural-based livelihood. And you can think about the immense problem of somebody who has done uh, livestock raising all their lives and their fathers and family members and all their brothers and sisters are all livestock raisers. And all of a sudden there's this idea or this um, question, go down to the river, start drawing water out and try agriculture. So you don't know what to plant, um, how to plant well, and you also don't know very much about how much water you're going to have and whether you can sustain your crops over time. So um, there are these uh, water resource user organizations that have developed in Kenya as a way to negotiate the communication between upstream and downstream users. Of course, it's an old trope that uh, downstream users are, um, get uh, screwed, basically. And this is uh, certainly some evidence of this here. Um, when we look at the upstream users, there are these smallholders. They've got title on their land. They've got a plot that is theirs. And there are also these greenhouses. And so many of the flowers that are sold in the Netherlands and in Europe actually come from white Kenyans who own property in these areas and are drawing a massive amount of groundwater in order to sustain the flowers that lead to commercial production that does employ uh, Kenyans. But um, there's questions about food security and translating water use for that use as opposed to for food production. And then downstream, you have, uh, I don't know if it shows up very well, but um, in the middle of that left-hand picture is a pump. And that is an illegal pump, and there's no kind of legal extraction of water using that mechanism. But downstream, there are users who are trying to make a go of agriculture, and so you have this very tricky dynamic where this is allowed, it's basically um, strictly not uh, prohibited, but it's overlooked effectively. Now, um, if we look at the landscape here, we can see very different expressions in terms of what kinds of food production we get. This is an upstream farm, and you can see how that looks not dissimilar to the kind of footprints we see of farms here in, in the United States and, and Indiana. But then downstream, there's this um, effectively a totally different land tenure arrangement that leads to a different uh, security system for farmers who are trying to um, make agricultural succeed there. But um, what happens effectively is in a, in a flood year, there's very little deviation. So they look at the blue, dark blue line and the light blue line. In a flood year, the bottom one, there's almost no difference between the natural discharge and how much water is actually in the water. In effect, there's very little water being drawn out because there's enough rain water to sustain agricultural production. In an average year, there's some bit of deviation from the natural discharge because there are people who are drawing water out as you go down the stream to the point where if you look at a low flow season in the very top, you get to a point some 30 kilometers downstream where there's no water in the stream. And this is what the problem is for the downstream users, obviously, who are transitioning their livelihoods to agriculture, and yet there are low flow years where they're not going to have any water. Um, the arrangement here, the infrastructure is one where there's a large pipe that's put in and these were placed in about 10 years ago and it was built based on the population at that time. A certain volume of pipe can carry a certain volume of water um, at a certain rate and what happens is that there's a few of these intakes that then deliver water down to communities as you go down the slopes of Mount Kenya. Um, 
What's happened, though, is that there's been variable population growth in these communities over time. So what was the demand for water resources in one community 10 years ago is different, and so the volume matched to supply and demand is getting shaken up a little bit. Um, but, um, in effect, there is now water rotation between communities uh, in times of water scarcity. That is, community A will say, okay, I get water on Tuesdays, and community B will get water on Thursdays. So that's the institution that has developed for this proportional water um, allocation. Then there's also water rotation within communities. So there's a reservoir in a community, and there will be farmers who are hooked up to a, a piped network. And so in my community, I might, I might get water on Tuesday from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and another farmer gets water from 6 o'clock until midnight. So there's multiple levels at which rationing is being um, played out here. In other words, there's a very polycentric or very redundant level of rationing that's happening in this place, um, which is kind of a striking management outcome. Um, so what this effectively looks like at, uh, in terms of a governance platform is that we've got consumers and users at the bottom, these water resource user associations in the middle, and these are legally recognized by the, water, by the government. There's a 2002 Water Act that said everybody has access to water. It doesn't mean that you get access to irrigation water, but you have access to water. But they recognize these organizations, these bottom-up, local-level organizations that can manage water resources at a local level. So if we look at this from a top-down, bottom-up kind of scheme, we see multiple levels of, uh, of uh, polycentricity or redundancy. We see enforcement and monitoring happening at the user level, at the community scheme level, at the RUA level, or the Water Resource User Association level. Um, and we also see rationing happening at multiple levels. And this is kind of, uh, now I'm going to take a, a slide from Nigel, who took uh, Lynn Ostrom's design principles for common pool resource systems. Um, he did a much better job than I, because he But if you take what's happening in Kenya, it's as if you did check by check, went through each of those design principles and said, yes, are there clear boundaries? Yes, well, there's a water resource that's in a particular stream. There's collective choice. There's actors at multiple levels, and they have a voice in the process. There is graduated sanctions. If I get caught stealing one time, it's a slap on the wrist. If I get caught a second time, I lose my connection to my pipe network. Um, there are mechanisms of upstream and downstream communication. So there's this conflict resolution mechanism. And there's recognition from higher level authorities. The government is recognizing these local level organizations that are managing water resources. Um, there's two others, though. Um, are rules adapted to local conditions? Maybe yes. There's water rationing happening at multiple levels. There's polycentricity. Um, in terms of monitoring, though, there's a big question mark. Um, so, the question then is, how can we take this kind of complex landscape, and I understand that there's, um, and, and actually I'm celebrating the diversity of scholars that are here, because I think it's a dialogue that we need to have in terms of how can you reconcile case-based analysis and case-based research and look for generalizations that apply across places. And one effort to do that is to use a, a a, a common coding scheme and try to document what is happening in one place and compare it to another. Now, there's obviously researchers who will say it is impossible to do that coding. You can't pack things into boxes like that. But there may be cases where that kind of packing can lead to some uh, interesting findings. So that's what we've tried to do um, using what's called the SES framework, uh, which um, Lynn Ostrom and other scholars developed. And I won't go through it in detail. The, the main story I'm trying to tell is that there are efforts to try to code complex systems into different kind of categories to document the salient characteristics of those places, both in terms of the physical characteristics and in terms of the social characteristics and the governance arrangements. So this is what we've done for the communities where we're working. We're looking at uh, not just these um, places in Kenya. So I showed you a, a snapshot of a place where we're working with 25 communities on the western slopes of Kenya. We're also working in an area on the southern slopes of Kenya where, believe it or not, in one of the most arid places in the world, there is intensive paddy rice production. The largest area of rice production for East Africa is actually on the slopes of Mount Kenya. 
So talk about water management. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to see, to drive through effectively what is a dry land ecosystem, and then all of a sudden you're in the middle of a bunch of rice paddies. And so we're comparing uh, about 50 communities and the governance arrangements in Kenya to 50 communities and their governance arrangements in Colorado as a comparison. And we're using this mechanism, this SES framework, to code these cases as our comparison. And what we're finding is that effectively there's no adaptation that we see in our Kenya cases. And that partly is a product of this water rationing. That is, they're not changing how much water different communities get over time. What they say is, well, the river has two-thirds less water in it. Well, you get two-thirds less water from your allocation, and you get two-thirds less water, and so on, which one can argue is not truly adaptive governance. They aren't adapting to what the demand for water resources is. They're sticking with the, the rules as usual. And that's partly because of a lack of information. We've tried to, uh, in our uh, research, we've tried to monitor how much water is going through these pipes, and there's so much debris and there's so much accumulation that we can't use mechanical filters to measure how much water there is. And there are other technologies, but they're much more expensive. So for these local level actors, these Kenyans, to deploy different kinds of monitoring is going to be an incredibly expensive and, and uh, maybe impossible kind of scenario. So um, one of the big uh, shortcomings in this particular research is that the governance arrangement basically is on target. They've designed the governance arrangement, the structures that on paper people say is going to lead to successful common pool resource management. Um, but there's an information flow that is not leading to proper adaptation over time, I would argue. Now, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, a, a transition that I want to make, and that is um, I had a former set of research on forest transition theory, and maybe some of you are familiar with this, but the story basically is that uh, an area that is developed will over deforest and actually start to deforest areas that are not sustainable for long-term production. And then over time, that will be a there will be a slight reforestation as people realize, well, this is an area that floods a lot or this is an area that's too dry. Um, or they have the, the means to create some protected areas. And thinking about that kind of forest transition is, uh, we can think about these transition points in this cycle. So there's a, this is from Foley and, and others who have worked on this, um, and I've done some comparison work between the US and Brazil on this. There's a question of when does restoration start? When is that tipping point where a country will go from, and this is all federal level data, will go from deforestation to reforestation. Why does it happen? When does it happen? And then at what level will a country reforest to? Two fundamental questions. And we can think about that. And when I was watching some of the presentations on uh, yesterday, it made me think about the implications of that forest transition for a water transition, if you will. So I'm trying to be a little provocative here to set us up for tomorrow to a certain extent. But um, the big orange thing here in the middle is basically what people were expressing yesterday as being this big pulse of uh, degradation in water quality. And what it made me think about a little bit is that there's kind of a lagged effect where there can be a intensive agricultural um, development that leads to some kind of reforestation, but there may still be yet several decades of water quality problems that may arise from the intensive agriculture and it seems like in Europe and the US, there are sites where that kind of water quality um, context is being dealt with. But what I would plant a seed with is Kenya being, and other kind of developed, less developed countries being several decades behind the US, both in terms of forest transition theory and in terms of water quality management. So what I would try to leave things with here is some questions um, such as, are there predictable trajectories for water governance? And trying to develop a set of data that can enable us to look for these generalizations across sites. And then identifying then what these pathways are. Why does one place go down one pathway and another place go down another pathway? And can, can we think of some candidates as a candidates to follow pathways seen in other places? So is uh, Mount Kenya decades ahead of what water governance might do in Zambia or other places in Africa, and is Kenya, for example, 50 years behind the, e the US and EU, and how can we change that trajectory? 
So uh, I hope that we'll explore some opportunities for uh, comparative analysis and meta-analysis in the discussion tomorrow. And uh, these are my collaborators here, and I had an obligatory slide with a giraffe in it for you. <laughs> <laughs>